Hi everyone, this is Vanessa here. Oh, Vanessa. Hi, Nelly. Yeah, okay, so great. We'll do the roll call and feel free to message me if you need anything during the meeting. Okay, so when I call your jurisdiction, please state your name, San Mateo County. Dave Pine. San Mateo Warren County. Slocum. Atherton. Warren Slocum. Rick DeGoy. Belmont. Julia Mates. Brisbane. Burlingame. Donna Colson. Colma. Daly City. Uh, Daly City. God does Magua. East Palo Alto. Carlos Romero. Foster City. Half Moon Bay. Okay, I see you. Thank you. Hillsboro. Los Banos. Tom Faria. Menlo Park. Betsy Nash. Millbrae. Pacifica. Tiger Jazz Big Stick. Portola Valley. Redwood City. San Bruno. Marty Medina. San Carlos. San Mateo. Rick Bonilla. South San Francisco. James Coleman. Woodside. And Director Emeritus. Ready, Gupta. Director Emeritus. John Keener. Thank you. Looks like we have a quorum. Uh, Nelly, I didn't hear you call Coma. Uh, Mikel Gonzalez. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, if uh, there's any public comment, now would be for an item that is not on the agenda, now would be a good time to provide that. And uh, you can either raise your hand or uh, easier at the bottom of your screen. If you click the reactions button, you can raise your hand down there. And if you raise your hand, I hopefully will see you. Uh, Jeremy. Greetings okay. board. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Greetings board. Uh, before be I begin, allow me to introduce myself. Once again, my name is Jeremy Sarnicki and I am running for the office of San Bruno City Council member to fight for the preservation of public land and public education, the building of affordable housing and the prospect of a sustainable future for all. The reason why I appear before you today is to make use of this public forum by voicing my strong concerns on the current state of our economy and the national well-being. Generally, my fear is this, for the last 16 months with ample evidence of Donald Trump's criminal conspiracy to subvert the 2020 election, Joe Biden has refused to hold Donald Trump accountable. Now with the Federal Reserve reversing its monetary policy of inflating the housing and stock market, we risk financial chaos at a time of rising GOP extremism and domestic terrorism. This has led me to the following conclusion. Joe Biden is not the leader we deserve or the leader we need. He is supposed to be the leader of the free world, and yet I'm afraid he's going to fall asleep in his bowl of soup. How can he run the country when he can't ride a bike? But these are just jokes. We cannot let his failures be the source of our misery, specifically when it comes to how we deal with the existential crisis of climate change, how much we can avert this accelerating mass extinction event before it consumes us entirely. Failure is not an option. How many among us believe that the Democrats have any chance of holding the majority this midterm election, or will they be defeated by a party whose former president tried to subvert the election? 
Thank you. Okay, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, it's come to my attention that Supervisor Slocum um, needs to be sworn in as a member of our board. So I would like to go ahead and do that um, unless there are other uh, public comments to be to be aired at this point. Okay, let, let's see. Are there any other public comments? I don't see any other hands. Uh, I don't think there are any other public comments at this time, Jennifer. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead. Um, Supervisor Slocum, I just want to make sure that you're with me. I can't see all of the pictures at one yeah. time. So I want to make sure that you're here to read back this, this oath with me. I'm here with you, but I'm on a phone because after the fire yesterday, the internet here is uh, not working properly. Okay, totally understandable. We'll do this super slowly and feel free to ask me to read anything back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll go ahead and start. Um, I, Supervisor Slocum, do solemnly swear. I, Supervisor Slocum, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to. To the, con to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of California. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I will take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Thank you. I can tell it isn't your first time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not my first time. Thank you. Welcome. I appreciate it. It's fine to move forward with the next agenda item. Say it again. Jennifer, I didn't hear you. I apologize. It's fine to move forward with the next agenda item. Yeah, that, that's what I'm doing. I, I, I was muted though. I, I didn't realize that I had been muted. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Let's see, I would, unless, did, does there anyone on the uh, board wish to pull any item on the consent calendar or does anyone have any comment on any item on the consent calendar? Uh, I don't see anyone's hand up. So could I please get a motion to set the agenda and approve the consent agenda items? So moved, Chair. Second, mates. Okay, so a motion from Benia, second from Nate. If we could please have a roll call. I'm sorry, I was on mute. San Mateo no. County? Yes. San Mateo Here. County? Here. Atherton? Yes. Belmont? Yes. Brisbane? Burlingame? Yes. Coma? Yes. Daly City? Yes. East Palo Alto? Yes. Foster City? Half Moon Bay? Yes. Hillsboro, Los Banos, 
Yes. Menlo Park? Yes. Millbrae? And Schneider, sorry, it was a few minutes late, but yes. Thank you. Pacifica? Yes. Portola Valley? Redwood City? San Bruno? Yes. San Carlos? San Mateo? Yes, here. South San Francisco? Yes. And Woodside? Thank you, the motion passes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the chair report. And I really don't have anything to report other than I have uh, created a subcommittee of the executive committee to do our annual CEO review. And that is made up of myself, uh, Donna Colson, uh, Julia Mates, and Jeff Alps. And if anybody else on the board would like to be informed as we go along, please uh, send me an email, just reach out to me and I will make that happen. I don't have anything else to report. So the next item on the agenda is the CEO report. Thank you. Um, welcome to everyone tonight. Um, I wanna thank Vanessa for taking on the board clerk duties today. Uh, Nelly is on a much deserved vacation after being very sick with COVID. And uh, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, first slide, please. So great news. Um, we have hired a CFO. Christina Aligar Cordero will be starting as our new CFO starting on July 25th. Um, I don't believe she's here tonight because she is away, but um, she comes to us from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And um, I think I sent a note out to all of you today, letting you know that this was, uh, that Christine is coming on board. So we're very excited about that. Next slide, please. Um, we have a bunch of positions that we are hiring for right now. A regulatory compliance analyst to work in our regulatory group with Jeremy an EV associate programs manager for, uh, to work in our programs team with uh, Raphael and gang. Uh, two people for the power resources team, a power resources manager and a renewable energy analyst. Uh, we're also bringing on our first ever human resources manager. And we are also looking for a director of power resources as Siobhan is going on to another position uh, mid-July, and we're sorry to see Siobhan go. So if you have people that you know of who might be excellent candidates for any of these positions, please uh, send them to our website, join our team. They can get all the details about the positions and submit their resume and answer the supplementary questions that we ask them. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to give you an update on CC Power. At last month's meeting, you voted to delegate authority to me to vote at the CC Power board meeting, which took place um, the next, that first workday, May 31st. And at that board meeting, we approved for CC Power to execute agreements for firm clean resources between CC Power and the Fish Lake Geothermal Project and a portfolio of geothermal projects that are being developed by ORMAT. So the next step is that we will be bringing uh, those projects to you at the July 28th board meeting for you to consider approving our participation in those two projects. So we look forward to, to being able to describe those to you and uh, having your approval. Next slide, please. I also wanted to alert you that we issued an RFP today for a portfolio of 15 public facility solar projects and a couple that include battery storage as well for, uh, that will be located on public facilities in San Mateo County and Los Banos. And we're, we're piloting a new um, business model where we will offer a PPA directly to each city that's going to be having one of these systems. 
And then we will be contracting directly with the solar contractors that will be constructing these facilities on the city buildings. And by aggregating these 15 projects, we expect to have lower costs for those facilities, translating into lower costs for the cities. And we're also looking at a couple of business models in our uh, RFP, we're asking for different types of, um, of bids to, uh, to maximize the ability to um, have the tax benefits, the investment tax credit and the accelerated depreciation represented in those projects and being able to further pass on savings to the cities. So um, the, this RFP is posted on our website um, and you're welcome to look at it and to uh, direct people to, to bid on this project. Next slide, please. Um, SVLG had their annual energy conference again this year that they hold at Oracle. It has been on, on pause for two years. And so um, I was fortunate to represent Peninsula Clean Energy there to speak on our 24 seven work. And uh, council member uh, or Mayor Bonilla was, was there as well. And uh, yesterday I presented at the American Solar Energy Society conference, their annual conference. It was virtual. They were in Albuquerque, I was here. And um, our PCE paper on 24 seven is being included in the conference proceedings. So we're getting the word out about what we're doing. Next slide, please. So this is a very busy time in the legislature. Um, there are a couple of bills that are headed to the assembly, um, a bill by our state Senator Josh Becker, SB 887, that looks at uh, transmission for clean energy, uh, passed the state Senate and is now before the assembly, SB 1020, um, which will help with home infrastructure upgrades, uh, passed the Senate and is now being held, heard in the assembly. Um, next slide, please. Three more bills are also headed to the assembly. Another bill by Senator Josh Becker for tariff on bill financing to um, notify people that their building is participating in such a program that passed the Senate and is going to the assembly. Another bill by uh, Senator Becker on planning goals for state agencies to be net zero by 2035. Um, similarly, going to the assembly. And then another bill by um, uh, Senator Archuleta on um, reach codes that we worked closely with the author, uh, we and Cal CCA, to make sure that it didn't jeopardize the work we've been doing on reach codes also passed the Senate and is going to the assembly. Uh, another bill, next slide please, is going to the Senate, AB 1944. This is one to allow um, people like you <laughs> to be able to teleconference into our meetings um, from a non-disclosed location so that you don't have to open up your home or your hotel room to the public. And that's headed to the Senate. And then last but not least, next slide, please. Um, SB 1158, another bill by Senator Becker, which we've been working closely with him on in terms of hourly reporting of GHG emissions. As you know, we have this 24 seven goal and we're leading the way on that. So that passed the Senate. Um, we provided testimony in support of that bill yesterday at the Assembly Committee on Utilities and Commerce. Actually, Mark Hirschman was there representing us. And Mark will be up there again on Monday to provide testimony um, in support of the bill at the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources. Um, and then next slide, lastly, showing the meetings coming up, Executive Committee, July 11th, the Citizens Advisory Committee, July 14th, and the next board meeting on July 28th. So I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. Okay. I don't see any questions. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is the Citizens Advisory Committee report. And it, Cheryl, are you going to give that? Yes, I am. Okay, great. 
Chair DeGolia and honorable members of the board. Our last CAC meeting held Thursday, June 9th was especially upbeat since we welcomed six new members from throughout the service area. Sincere thanks to the board for thoughtfully choosing these savvy individuals who have diverse experiences and interests, including a former 35-year employee of the EPA, a former city manager, a current civil environmental engineer, and a current architect. We took time for self-introductions from new and current members, as well as staff, trying to develop a little bit of camaraderie in these unfortunate pandemic times that prevent in-person meetings. After David Silberman's Brown Act training for the entire CAC, Rafael Reyes shared a meaty overview of Peninsula Clean Energy programs and an update on reach codes that communities will use to help decarbonize buildings. Kirsten Andrew Schwind explained opportunities that members will have to join new work groups and asked everyone to consider nominations for chair and vice chair before elections in July. That's my summary. I'm happy to answer a question or two. Keep going muted. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions. Somebody's hand is up just, and I'm not seeing you just yell out, but <clears throat> in the absence of that, we will move on. And the next item on the agenda, <clears throat> is a report and approval of the fiscal year 22-23 budget. <clears throat> Hello, uh, this, uh, my name is Andy Stern. Um, the, uh, let me go through the uh, review of the budget schedule and where we are. Um, on May 9th, we reviewed a initial draft budget with the Audit and Finance Committee as well as the Executive Committee. Um, and that same uh, to gain comments, although there weren't any substantive comments, um, we reviewed that same draft budget with the board last uh, month on May 26th. On June 13th, we reviewed a revised um, final budget, although there wasn't, there weren't any changes to the budget um, other than minor changes um, and an update of what our expectations are for the end of June 30th, 2022. Um, and at that meeting, the Audit and Finance Committee recommended approval to the board of the final budget. Um, since that date, uh, there have been, has been some minor adjustments to the end of the year forecast of June 30th, 2022, which I'll point out uh, in a following slide, but that the board, that the Audit and Finance Committee's recommended um, budget uh, approval is still unchanged uh, and we'll, we're asking for the board to approve that budget uh, tonight uh, at tonight's meeting per our, per the California uh, rules and regulations to approve before June 30th. Um, the key assumptions uh, are largely unchanged from last time. Um, pg e generation rates, uh, which our PCE's rates are, are uh, based on, um, or has, will show a significant rise in rates uh, effective as of April 1 um, that you uh, reviewed a couple of months ago. They increased 33%. Uh, and the uh, expectation for January 1, 2023, which is about six months from now, which is halfway through our fiscal year is that they will drop another 10%. However, the net change is up 20% um, even on that date uh, as compared to a couple of months ago or several months ago. Uh, and just as an FYI, um, because rates for San Mateo County and Los Panos are based on uh, the same pg e rates in the same pg e territory, the rates for those two uh, constituencies are the same. PCIA rates um, also have, showed a significant decrease uh, on April 1. Um, they decreased 59%. Um, our expectation for January 1, 2023 is that they will go back up 65% from the current level. Um, however, the net change is down 32% uh, uh, as of January 1, 
as compared to what it was back before April 1. Um, and the because the PCIA rate is based on territories um, and based on uh, vintage of when uh, territories join CCAs, the Los Banos PCIA rate is higher than San Mateo County starting on April 1. Um, it's lower on January 1, 2023, and then the both of them are comparable after that date. <clears throat> uh, the rates to PCE um, are as a result of the combination of pg e generation rates and PCIA rates are up more than 100% um, as compared to uh, what they were just a few months ago um, through January 1, 2023, although customers only pay an additional 33%, which is based on the pg e generation rates. Um, but the PCIA, the what customer, who customers pay, so a, port, a larger portion of PCE and a smaller portion of PG&E is a result of the PCIA rates. I'm happy to go through that in more detail, but it is confusing. Um, another factor, major factor that we uh, forecast in our budget is our load, um, our FY 2023, uh, which is the period from July 1 uh, in a week from now through the June 30th next year is forecasted to be 3.2% higher than the four FY22 forecast, um, but the FY22 forecast only included three months of Los Banos, so not surprising that it would be up some. Um, the cost of energy is budgeted to increase 18% over the uh, forecast for June 30th, um, and but to 263 million. And as I mentioned last month, that includes a $15 million conservatism adder over and above what we have uh, uh, done a bottoms up forecast based on uh, market estimates and market forecasts for energy costs. Um, then, and to, the reason that's in is because energy prices have been wildly volatile over the last six months and we're, we're uh, adding because we can some additional conservatism in case it uh, continues to be volatile. Um, and without that adder, it still would be 11% higher in the coming year. Any questions? Okay, um, this is the same summary I showed last time, um, but I'll go through it briefly. Um, the uh, column that's highlighted in yellow is the most recent change in our in rates, um, uh, and the four one twenty the column to the left of that of, of April 1, 2021 was the last time we changed rates. Um, so pg and &E generation rates are up thirty three percent. They're pro projected to go down 20, ten percent as I mentioned on January 1, 2023, um, and then down three percent and down an additional one percent and up one percent in the coming five years after that. Um, and right below that, you can see the cumulative change. So 33 percent and the, after that, the, the cumulative change is 20 percent. So even with the ups and downs over the next four years, um, rate pg and &E generation rates are expected to be higher uh, than they were just uh, six months ago. Uh, the PCIA which is a major factor in PCE's revenues, uh, as I mentioned, is down 59% on, on April 1, uh, a few months ago, um, and is expected to uh, increase 65% on, gen go back up, bounce back up on January 1, 2023, although the cumulative impact is 32% down. And it is expected um, based upon a good deal of uh, expert opinions to bounce up and down over the next three years after that, although still substantially less than it was uh, at its worst point uh, just a few months ago. And the PCE rate to ratepayers, as I mentioned, is up 109%, so basically more than double uh, of what uh, we were, we uh, PCE's revenues were for the same uh, rates uh, to customers. Um, Although, as I mentioned, the, uh, what customers pay is not that extra 109%, it's just really 33%. Um, and the impact on the above two PG&E generation rates and PCIA 
um, are on a cumulative basis is expected to be about 60% higher than um, it was just a few months ago for the next four years. Uh, Los Banos, um, as a result, uh, similarly, although not as big an impact on PCE's budget, um, the PCIA by itself is predicted, projected, or was down 11% and is expected to um, go up a little bit over the next couple of years and then down again, uh, cumulatively unchanged over four years, although the, uh, the impact to PC, it doesn't have an impact to customers, but the impact to PCE will be up and down as a result in most PCIA. That is a lot of numbers and a lot of confusing information, but anything I can explain, I'm happy to try. Okay, I'll go on, move on. Sorry. Is that a question? question? Okay. I don't see anyone with a hand up, Andy. All right, good. So this slide um, has uh, six columns of numbers. Um, the left three are the current fiscal year, which are updated as current as we can, which is through April, um, April's financial information and a forecast for the rest of the fiscal year. So May and June, um, we haven't closed May yet, so I haven't got numbers, but our forecast. Um, if you look at those three columns, the change in that position forecast is for a loss of six and a half million dollars. That's favorable to the budgeted level of 12 of 18.7 million dollar loss. Um, so a 12 million dollar benefit. Um, that's a couple of million dollars better than I showed at the last board meeting, um, which is the significant change in um, and this, the, the most significant change from what I showed the audit and finance committee. Um, we had a $2 million expectation or possibility that we might have to pay to the, um, for our, the, to the state for our EV programs, but that has um, been delayed uh, and will happen in future years. Um, the right three columns is the proposed budget. Um, uh, the column with the arrow is what we are asking for uh, approval tonight. Um, the uh, circled areas are revenues, which this is a big change, the biggest change in our budget. So 360, almost $368 million of revenues, which is $126 million more revenue than we are forecasting for uh, the current fiscal year, um, largely because of the PCIA change. Um, the, uh, if you look down towards the bottom, the change in that position, expected level of almost $74 million of positive, which is significantly higher than the $6.5 million loss forecasted for this current year. Um, and our uh, forecasted level of uh, unrestricted days cash on hand is 289. Um, as you probably remember, our uh, approved uh, board policy is to maintain a level which is at least 180 days. So that 289 day expectation is higher than the 239 that we're forecasting for the current fiscal year. Um, per the board's decision and audit and finance committee recommendation a couple of years ago, this board, the approval um, looks at the, this whole column, but the actual approval is for the level of total operating expenses, which is circled in blue. So what this board will is being asked to approve and the resolution that's in your package is to approve a not to exceed level of operating expenses of $294,429,488. Any questions before I show the five-year plan? Okay. Um, the... Uh, this is the, uh, the left three columns are the same three as on the prior page of the pro proposed budget. Um, and then the right four are more informational than, um, than approval, um, but it is to give you a projection and a, a view of where we believe will be based upon um, highly volatile energy prices predicted out several years. Um, 
it's a um, but it's our best guess at where we think we'll be. Um, and uh, based upon that guess at this point and um, a, a bottoms up forecast, we expect that our change in that position will be positive at each of the last, next four years of 13.8, 14.8, 22 million and 26 million, and that our unrestricted days cash on hand will be well in excess of 350 days. Um, if all of our revenue and load and expense forecasts all and energy forecasts all play out. However, that's not what we're asking for approval tonight. What we're asking for approval is where the red uh, arrow is uh, and the blue circle of total operating expenses of 294 million plus is the uh, recommended board approval. Any questions? Uh, I don't see any questions, Andy. I just want I see to Donna. One. I'm, I'm sorry. No. May I, Mr. Oh, Chair? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so can you just, Andy, can you just remind everyone, please? So what happens? We, we approve a $295 essentially million dollar operating expense budget. Um, if somehow we're going to exceed that operating expense budget. Can you just remind us what the process is? Do we come back? Do we, do we get approval? Do you have a, a leeway? We, we have built in some leeway. I think there's a contingency in there a little bit, little bit. I forget where that is. You know, can you just remind us how that works? Yep. So let me go back a page um, to start with the left three columns are the current year fiscal uh, estimated um, budget. So the budget, uh, which is ends in a week from now, um, the 2022 approved budget was operating expenses of 241,811,865. Our current forecast is that we're going to exceed that by 527,000. Um, and as a result, we, uh, have an obligation to come back to the board to get approval to uh, spend over to spend ab above that level, um, and um, and document that the board does un understands that we went over the budget and because we will act if that forecast holds true, um, and it's less than um, what is it less than a third of a percent or a quarter of a percent of exp of of, uh, of expenses from last year. Um, and so we may still end up being below that um, before well, when we finally do all the final accounting and finish our audit. Um, but assuming this plays out that the forecast is above, we will need to come back to the board to get approval for that uh, level of the spending. Uh, the same holds true for the coming fiscal year. Uh, the board would approve expenses of $294 million. Um, and if we, assuming we don't exceed that, then we don't need to come back for an additional review and a, or additional approval. However, throughout the year, um, we will we monitor, eight, monitor expenses and provide an ongoing forecast um, to the Audit and Finance Committee and to the board as part of its quarterly package um, the, to monitor where we are and how we're doing and what we, what we might need to do to adjust expenses um, throughout the year. So I don't know, if, does that explain, that, does that answer yeah, your question? That, that, that does. And, um, and I just appreciate you explaining that because I think we have some new board members and it's helpful for everyone to understand the process, I think. Thank you very much, Andy. Okay, does anybody else have a question? I don't see any other questions, Andy. Okay, well, then I'm hope I'm hoping I'm hoping, Mr. Chair, that you'll uh, uh, entertain a motion to approve the budget. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, if anyone has any comment. Uh, now would be an, on the budget for next year. Now would be an appropriate time. And I've got a couple uh, comments. Uh, 
uh, let me first take any, uh, do you have a question, Rick? I was gonna suggest we have public comment, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm gonna ask for public comment as soon Thank as you. I know there's no questions, yeah. Uh, Donna, do, is your hand still up? Mine's, mine's comment when we're ready to go. Okay, great. Let me see if there's any public comment and then we'll bring it back for board comments. Uh, Drew, do you have a public comment? Yes, I do. Um, just a quick question slash comment, how these goes. And I may be confused, so I apologize if this is way off. I thought in the last six months, maybe it's even farther back, there was a version of the budget with like forecasted out five years and some stuff where the unrestricted cash days on hand was like going down, like just the way things were working, things were going a different direction. And so that just led me to, I'm just wondering in this, the five-year versions, I'm sure it was really hard with how things are popping up and down and stuff, but just like how sensitive is that forecast? Like if some of the raw inputs doubled, would the days at hand go down by like 30% or stuff? Like just a little bit how that five-year view, like given the inputs, how dramatic would things change it completely around? That's kind of what I was just wondering. Thank you very much. Andy, do you want to respond to that? Uh, would you like me to respond? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yes, uh, I, I'm not sure it was six months, well, it might've been six months ago um, that, and I'd have to look back on it, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, when the PCIA was significantly higher than it is today. Um, and there, I think it was a surprise to uh, us and to other CCAs that the PCIA did go down as much as it did. Um, uh, our forecast, uh, as you can see from this screen, our budget last year was a loss of eight, uh, for this year was $18.7 million loss. And, and uh, in our last year's uh, view of the next five years, um, we had uh, expected losses in two of the next five years. Um, so we were looking at a, a fairly dire view with um, days cash on hand approaching 200 if I'm not, if I if memory serves. Um, the change in the PCIA um, and the re substantial reduction in the PCIA has had a uh, or will have, has had and will have a substantial positive impact to PCE. Um, and the PCIA is highly sensitive to uh, energy costs. So as energy costs have um, increased significantly, um, and I don't wanna get into a long explanation of PCIA. In fact, other people would be better at describing it than me. Um, but as, piece, as energy costs go up, um, our, the PCIA goes down and it shifts uh, rev, customer revenues from PG&E to PCE and therefore uh, substantially uh, improves the, the outlook uh, for, um, for PCE from a revenue uh, and profitability standpoint. Um, the um, it, it, predicting uh, energy costs from uh, day to day, much less year to year and multi years is, uh, is um, very difficult and um, uh, 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 will be wrong tomorrow and much more wrong probably in two to five years. Um, we have built in some level of contingency as uh, Donna mentioned, $15 million of contingency is built into the cost of energy in the coming fiscal year and another, and I don't have that number at hand, but another roughly $30 million or so is built in as contingency over the next several years as well, um, over and above our forecast for those energy prices. Um, but energy prices are, uh, as, as ha have been highly volatile and energy forecasters have been, uh, price forecasters have been very wrong. Um, relative to what they were a year ago. So I, I can't um, directly comment to Drew's question about how much um, how, how much uh, our net position on our day's cash on hand would change as a result of, of the energy prices. Um, but energy price, energy costs, as you can see from this, are roughly 85 or more 
percent of our costs, and if they're volatile, that'll that could substantially change or would substantially change the outlook of uh, our financials. Uh, yeah, thank you, Andy. Sure. And, and Drew, I, I would just back up what Andy said by observing that the projections for what our energy costs are and where the PCIA is have fluctuated dramatically over the last few months, let alone the last couple of years. And while it's appropriate that we look at a projection for the next five years, you, nobody can fully rely on it because if you just look at the fluctuations that have occurred in the last year, they're seriously dramatic. And you know, there's no assurance that uh, they're not going to continue to be dramatic. In fact, I would guess that the expectation is that they will be, and we don't entirely know where that's going to go. So we're gonna see a lot of fluctuation and the, the real focus is exactly what Andy targeted with his red arrow, which is the proposed budget and not the projections over the next years. Is there any other public comment? Okay, I don't, uh, I don't see any public comment. So uh, I'll, I've got a comment first from Donna and then from Carlos. Um, thank, thank you, Chair DeGolia. So I, I really um, want to just say how much I appreciate that the staff has been focused on the things that we can control like the cost of energy. In other words, by uh, putting contracts in place that will shore up a lot of that future demand and um, also the hedging that they have done to help dampen the volatility around this. I also um, appreciate that we are very sensitive to the number of days cash on hand and the amount of uh, net position and, and how that might potentially increase. This is the hardest budget I've ever worked on. It's not a complex budget, but the lack of ability to forecast in these markets is, um, is, is really uh, difficult. It's very difficult to get your head wrapped around it all and get it right. Um, and I do think that uh, just in case any of the members of the public are looking, energy prices have been difficult not only home energy, but gas and other things. So that 289 days and all that cash on hand, we are trying to figure out, and I'm sure that there will be a lot of conversations over the next year about how to manage that and, and how that needs to get reinvested in programs or um, you know, back to the rate payers. But we don't have a solution right now, but I want people to know we are thinking about it. And, and that's it really, Rick, thank you. Great, thank you, Donna. Carlos. Uh, yes, uh, Donna, I, I think Donna has said um, much of what I wanted to say. Um, I did want to say though to Andy, who has been with us for a while and then actually came back, and I know we're gonna have a new CFO, but I very, very much appreciate um, one, your being able to dig into these numbers to then explain them to the finance committee. And you know, we have asked you a number of questions several times. And if you didn't have the answer at that meeting, you would come back to us and provide it. And you really rolled up your sleeves to understand um, what is an unpredictable and sometimes volatile market. I know you come from a, from a different sector and very much appreciate all of the work you've done for us. And I mean, I, I'm looking forward to working with the new CFO, but I will certainly miss you, Andy, one for your directness and your thorough analytical nature. Um, I, I do want to say that, that I, I agree with Donna in particular on the, um, the unrestricted cash days on hand. I think we have a benchmark, I believe it's 180 days. I think, I don't think it's 210, I think it's 180. So we're clearly in excess of that. And as Donna mentioned, um, certainly the board and staff need to uh, grapple with one, the volatility and the uncertain nature of these markets and get comfortable with perhaps drawing down uh, that unrestric unrestricted cash days on hand. Um, and I'm not gonna say what we could do with it. There are various options that we could do within the year or the following year, but I think it is important for us to think about 
um, what we do with that cash. We are not here to amass huge sums of money. We are here to green and decarbonize the economy. And to the extent that we can use some of this funding in the future to do just that, possibly some rebates, we need to think about it. So it's a great place to be. Um, highly volatile PCIA, highly volatile uh, energy markets. But um, again, I think staff has done a good job of, of, of trying to contain our costs, the hedging. And uh, we will, as Donna said, uh, be revisiting um, what we do do with some of this cash. And just, just a quick story, the first day I was on, the first meeting I was on, I was sitting next to Dave Klein, the savvy um, member of this board. And I looked at him and I looked at the projections and I said, uh, Dave, uh, this is a bucket load of money. I think I actually may have used a slightly more coarse term. Uh, and Dave kind of said, yeah, it is. And so here we are at a place where we do need to begin to think about how we're kind of equitably um, you know, holding this money and moving in the direction that we need to move, which is again, decarbonizing this economy. Again, thank you to staff. Thank you to Andy, I will miss you, um, but I'm looking forward to working with the new CFO. Great, thank you, Carlos. Yeah, I, I, I wanna emphasize what Carlos just said. You know, we are not a bank and this budget shows that uh, we're accumulating approximately $94 million of cash over the next year. I take that with a grain of salt because I've watched the way this changed uh, over the last year. And I think we all just need to watch this as it goes. Uh, I agree with Carlos in terms of his characterization of the mission. I would also add, it's absolutely our job to provide energy to our customers at the best cost we can. And so, uh, you know, we're not in the business of banking money. We're in the business of providing energy at a cheap cost, have it be clean and help decarbonize our environment. So. Uh, we've got a good amount of money if this holds up. I just think we have to watch it during the year. We can't assume that this is going to be accurate because of the fluctuation we saw over the last year. But I think everybody has to think about that as we go forward. Are there any other comments from members of the board? Don't see anyone else with a comment. Uh, okay, I have a public comment. Is your public comment on this item, Jeremy? Yes, it is. Okay, we've got your, go ahead. Thanks. So, yeah, that's a boatload of money, ain't it? Um, reminds me of the $90 billion California surplus Hopefully some of that can go to uh, accelerating the decarbonization of our grid and the implementation of charging stations and electric vehicles. Something that I think can be done in the next 10 years at a very aggressive pace if done right. Um, yeah, and we have, uh, I actually just saw the uh, full portion of SB 67, which was really a carve out for nuclear. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays out uh, in the coming years. Um, but I'm not really actually gonna talk about the budget. I'm actually not gonna talk about renewable energy. What I wanna talk to you guys about is the uh, disgusting contempt for working people that uh, manifested in the uh, toll lanes along the US 101. I would like to make it known to you that it is my mission to make sure that no one who voted for that ever serves in public office ever again. Uh, my motto is buck the status quo because if that is what can uh, propagate, um, obviously we have the wrong uh, priorities. And when we are talking about budgets, I think it needs to be said that um, we need elected officials who, um, can actually have the courage to um, argue with a um, insatiable defense budget, which uh, $20 billion can become $60 billion, which can become $90 billion very quickly. We will never have enough money 
to build a future that we need if we are wasting it with our defense spending. Thank you so much. Me again. Can I get a motion to approve this item? So moved, Mr. Chair. Second, Romero. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Could we take a roll call, please? San Mateo County? Yes. San Mateo County? Atherton? Yes. Belmont? Yes, yes. Brisbane? Burlingame? Yes. Coma? Yes. Daly City? Yes. East Palo Alto? Yes. Foster City? Yes. Half Moon Bay? Yes. Hillsboro? Los Banos? Yes. Menlo Park? Yes. Millbrae? Yes. Pacifica? Yes. Portola Valley? Redwood City? San Bruno? Yes. San Carlos? San Mateo? Yes. South San Francisco? Yes. And Woodside? Thank you. The motion passes. Okay, great. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item number eight, which is uh, an action item for approval of new PCA energy rates to be effective July 1st, 2022. Hello. Uh, how are you guys doing tonight? Thank you. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so Andy just got uh, through talking about um, rates and changes that were made uh, April 1st, but um, as you recall last month, we uh, gave you a heads up to some uh, more changes that were gonna be coming through from PG&E uh, on June 1. If I can get the next slide, please. So there were some changes that came through in rates um, on June 1 uh, as a package of uh, updates. Uh, several of the items were actually transmission and distribution related, um, which don't affect Peninsula Clean Energy's rates, but there was uh, some adjustments that happened in that uh, advice letter that were related to uh, generation um, rates. Uh, it was a uh, rate adjustment or revenue it, or adjustments in the allocation of revenues across PG&E's tariffs related to the uh, 2020 uh, GRC phase two uh, proceedings. So what that actually means is um, uh, as part of the uh, rate design or rate redesign uh, proceedings that pg e you know, is going through with the commission, which happens separate from the, the air forecast and, and all of that stuff that we deal with on an annual basis, um, there is some requirements that, uh, you know, pg e allocate their revenues across, you know, their rates and tariffs accordingly in a proportional way. Um, so, this is referred to as revenue neutral from PG&E's perspective because no additional revenue is projected to be gained by the adjustments that they made across uh, generation rates. However, from our perspective as Peninsula Clean Energy, it does impact our revenue a little bit because we don't serve the entire uh, customer base. Of, you know, we don't serve all the PG&E's customers, so we don't have the same quite the same distribution of energy uh, being collected, you know, across residential customers, across particular tariffs as uh, pg &E does, obviously, because we're just servicing San Mateo County and the city of Los Banos. However, you know, these changes, because they are a real reallocation and not an increase or decrease in revenue overall, they are somewhat nominal for the most part. Some rates 
in the peak and off peak, you know, uh, segments uh, did change um, quite a bit. Um, but some of those changes are actually in tariffs that are going to change again before they come into effect, like super off peak, you know, large commercial rates that won't uh, come into effect until m March of next year. And they will already change again before we get around to that, uh, that rate cycle. So with all of that said, um, I do have some updates I can share with you in regards to the changes in PCIA. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so just a quick review, when pg e makes changes to either the generation rate or the PCIA, that it impacts Peninsula Clean Energy's rates. We want to we want to maintain our net five percent discount relative to what PG&E is, is charging for generation. We have to make adjustments along the way, which is why we're coming to you for this uh, approval to make the rate changes. Next slide. So here is we have two vintages that we are making uh, rates relative to the 2016 PCI vintage that covers San Mateo County and the 2021 vintage that uh, covers Los Banos. So as you can see, there were some changes in PCIA, not consistent across the rate classes, different depending on you know, which rate class, pretty small changes for the most part. Bigger changes are in some of the specialized rates like street lights um, and the BEV1 um, rate, but the other uh, PCIA rate classes are pretty nominal in their change and go to the 2021 vintage. So similar, similar changes you know, across the board, but not exactly the same um, percentage across each rate class. As you can see, it's going up in some rate classes, going down in some other rate classes, hence the overall um, revenue neutral from PG&E's perspective uh, for these changes when applied across the territory. Um, so we got these uh, new rates on January 1, uh, or not sorry, January, June 1st, when the new tariffs were published. We went through, um, made the uh, changes on both of our tariff sheets for uh, San Mateo County and for Los Santos, submitted those to uh, Calpine, um, our back-end provider and billing agent, to get them prepped um, and ready to implement July 1, uh, pending uh, board approval tonight. Go to the next slide. So this is what we're asking for tonight is to authorize the resolution uh, to uh, change our rates to be effective July 1 to maintain that net 5% discount in generation charges for the Eco Plus um, compared to PG&E. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, thank you, Leslie. I don't see any questions. If anyone has a question, just raise your hand. I don't see any questions. So <clears throat> let's see if there's any public comment on this matter. I don't see any public comment. Um, if, if there's any comment from anyone on, uh, Kathleen Goforth has a comment. Actually, I just have a question. Um, I'm just trying to follow this. I'm wondering, is there any effect on the Eco 100 uh, rate? Uh, Eco 100 is one cent above Eco Plus. So we're not making any changes to Eco 100, but the total, you know, the total cost to a customer, um, you know, would change relative to whatever's happening on the Eco Plus side. That makes sense. So, so just to repeat what what Leslie said, this this proposal was to change the Eco Plus rates, and because the Eco Plus rates uh, change, that will absolutely change the Eco One Hundred rate, which is the Eco Plus rate plus one penny. So, it's exactly the same change in terms of the base level. Not the percentage is slightly different, but it's the same change. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other public comments. Are there any comments from members of the board? I don't see anyone with a hand up. Uh, can I get a resolution approving the rate change proposal? 
So moved. Okay, thank you, Harvey. And can I get a second? Second. Okay, Donna. thank you, Donna. Could we please do a roll call? San Mateo County. Yes. San Mateo County. Atherton. Sorry, yes. Belmont. Yes. Brisbane. Burlingame. Yes. Colma. <coughs> Sorry, Coma. Yes. Just Daily City. Anybody? Yes. East Palo Alto. Yes. Foster City. Yes. Half Moon Bay. Yes. Hillsboro. Los Banos. Yes. So I would like to call back. Menlo Park. Yes. The first two words are Millbury. Yes. Pacifica. Yes. Portola Valley. I'm really excited to present two Redwood really, City. Uh, two really meaningful awards. The first San is Bruno. Tora, yes. The Light of Torah. San Carlos. And it's given to a congregant who shows San Mateo. up for a study, a yes. learning. South San Francisco. I, Yes. And what side? Thank you, the motion passes. Okay, great, thank you, Vanessa. And the next item on the agenda is item number nine, which is the Calpine Master Services Agreement Amendment for Flex Market, which is before us as an action item. Hello, everybody. This is Peter Levitt speaking. Um, I am on Rafael Reyes's team, the Energy Programs team. I've been with PCE for three years. It's great to chat with everybody again. Um, we are going to talk about the Calpine Services uh, Master Services Agreement uh, and the amendment thereof for Flex Market. If you can keep going, Vanessa. The program resolution here is delegate authority for the CEO to amend the Master Services Agreement between Peninsula Queen Energy and Calpine resulting in payments by Peninsula Queen Energy in an amount not to exceed $4,678,563 over three years for the flex market program and in a form approved by the general counsel. The amendment will enable the launch of our flex market program. This is an innovative uh, load shaping program that um, is uh, a pay for performance program. Peninsula Clean Energy pays for load shaping performance, which is determined by actual meter readings. All program expenses are fully reimbursed by the CPUC. We'll be working together with Calpine and Recurve, who have a strategic partnership formed and are working jointly to help us launch the program. Several of our peers have launched a program similar to this, um, such as MCE, EBCE, and uh, SCP. The objectives of the program are to pilot an innovative load shaping model to support summer reliability by reducing peak load and to align customer load with grid needs to complement our 24 seven renewable energy goal. Keep it going, Vanessa. The way the flex market structure works is PCE registers prices for hourly load shaping onto the program. Next. Aggregators then engage with the program, with the, the platform rather, and those prices determine how much they will get paid for installing certain measures. Next. Aggregators find customers and install those measures. Next. After installation, the platform receives customer meter data. And then two more clicks. 
and then um, recurve processes that meter data to compare against what the custom, how the customers were using load before to how they're using load now, which determines their net load impact and uh, shows what the new load shape is for that customer. Keep going, Vanessa. Last year, towards the end of last year, uh, the board approved PCE to make a program plan and submit a, that plan to the CPUC. Um, we did that in February of this year. And then in May of this year, the CPC approved our plan and proposal and funded us up to $4.6 million over three years for this program, all of which is fully reimbursed by the CPC. We then continued uh, designing the program with, in partnership with Recurve and also Calpine and negotiated the contract uh, through June with Calpine and Recurve, as well as developed an implementation plan. Um, upon seeking approval or receiving approval for uh, the amendment that will enable this program, we will then continue to establish the program design, recruit aggregators, and launch the program. Keep going, Vanessa. Lastly, the details of the contract. Um, the scope of work is between Calpine and Recurve, but primarily Calpine as they are the signatory to the contract but it is for both Calpine and Recurve to implement and administer the program for PCE. This will enable us to have them recruit aggregators and process payments for us, collect and share project data with us, calculate customer energy savings, grid value derived from the better load shape and payments to aggregators. They will also validate aggregators invoices, support regulatory reporting, create a dashboard for us to monitor program success and um, to uh, administer pay, the pay for performance payments to Calpine and Recurve themselves. That concludes the deck for Flex Market and the amendment to the master services agreement. Vanessa, do you want to just go back to the second slide with the resolution? Great. So now we will pause for questions. Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, are, so are there any questions on the Calpine Recurve Flex Market Program or on the specific contract that is before us? <clears throat> okay, I don't see any questions. Is there any public comment on this matter? Okay, I don't see any public. Uh, there's a comment from Jeremy. Hey guys, so I know you think I have a really big mouth and all. So uh, I'm just gonna leave you with this. Buck the status quo, Giselle Hale, Assembly District 21, book it. Have a great day. Okay, um, I don't see any more public comment. Uh, let's bring it back to the board. Are there any comments from members of the board? Not seeing any comments from members of the board. Can I get a resolution to approve this amendment? I'll move approval of the amendment, Dave Pine. Okay, thank you, Dave. Second. Carlos Romero. Okay, thank you, Carlos. If we could do a roll call, that'd be great. San Mateo County? Yes. San Mateo County? Atherton? Yes. Belmont? Yes. Brisbane. Burlingame. Yes. Colma. Yes. Daly City. Yes. 
East Palo Alto? Yes. Foster City? Yes. Half Moon Bay? Yes. Hillsboro? Los Banos? Yes. Menlo Park? Yes. Millbrae? Yes. Pacifica? Yes. Portola Valley? Redwood City? San Bruno? Yes. San Carlos? San Mateo? Yes. South San Francisco? Yes. And Woodside? Thank you, the motion passes. Thank you, everybody. Okay, great. Yes, thank you. The, the next item on the agenda is a discussion item which uh, concerns uh, where we stand with respect to the 2022 REACH codes. And just to frame it, the, the REACH codes end at the end of this year. So we've been at this for quite some time and this is an update. Thank you, Chair DeGolia. Uh, my name is Blake Hershaft. I'm a programs manager at Peninsula Clean Energy. I'll be presenting on this discussion item. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what are REACH codes and why are they important? Many of, uh, many of you know this right now. Uh, REACH codes are local enhancements to the state building code that can be adopted at any time. Um, it are the REACH codes we're proposing or that we're discussing tonight include uh, building electrification and electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, a reason to pass them is, is it is the most cost effective way to decarbonize buildings and add electric vehicle charging. Um, they've already been very successful. Uh, all electric buildings are typically less expensive, less expensive to construct than buildings with two fuels. And EV charging is much less expensive to install during new construction than to retrofit. Next slide. A recap, this program has been extremely successful. Um, thanks for all the leadership. Uh, it, it, you know, as you can see from this chart, in Peninsula Clean Energy, 15 jurisdictions have adopted REACH codes. Um, 67, we are sharing our REACH codes among, uh, we share this effort among East Bay Community Energy and Silicon Valley Clean Energy. 67% uh, of the member agencies have adopted among those three groups. 61% uh, of, that represents 61% of electrification REACH codes statewide. Um, 23 of those 33 adopters also had EV infrastructure codes. Next slide. Uh, this is the timeline we're on. The goal is to adopt uh, the new building code. The 2022 California building code needs to be adopted by all jurisdictions by the end of the year to go into effect January 1st, 2023. Our goal is to align the reach codes to adopt along the same timeline. Uh, we're, we started in January by kicking off the process, had a lot of outreach at the beginning of the year, and then started drafting codes. The new construction codes for electric vehicles and all electric buildings are available online uh, at the moment at the bayareareachcodes.org website. The existing building reach codes, which I'll discuss later, are in draft form, and we are looking, uh, for, we are looking for input from the board tonight and looking forward to uh, releasing them soon after tonight's input. Blake, apologies for interrupting. I'm noticing that uh, Councilwoman Schneider uh, has raised her hand with a comment or question. Thank you. I can wait, Mr. Reyes. And uh, thank you. And, and uh, we should note here that uh, the, the most recent uh, city to adopt the REACH codes uh, was the city of, of Belmont just uh, in the last few weeks. And so uh, uh, congratulations to congratulations Belmont. Congratulations to Belmont. I meant to lead with that. And I am, uh, we're very excited for Belmont and thankful. Thank you for your leadership, Belmont. Next slide. Um, maybe flip through this. Looks like there's an animation. You can just go to a, one more. There you go. Uh, the proposed 2022 building electrification reach codes uh, for new construction. Uh, new construction is require, required to be all electric uh, with some exceptions. Um, there's a list of exceptions that are optional for cities. Some cities in the last cycle 
uh, had exemptions for different building types, depending on the buildings that were built in their jurisdictions. Um, the new construction definition we currently have written um, has to do with 50% uh, above sill framing or 50% of foundation uh, changes that uh, often cities already have definitions of new constructions and they do vary across the county. Um, some, some exceptions, uh, infeasible to construct due to the California Energy Code, public interest, uh, technology specific exceptions, um, which may, may be able to sunset over time. Um, and then when, when there is an exception, typically uh, the REACH code requires electric readiness to be installed uh, if a gas piece of gas infrastructure is installed. And that's for buildings. Next slide. Uh, just some background on EV code terminology um, before we get into the code. Uh, when we're talking about speed, that's the speed of charging. Level one plugs into a 120 volt outlet. Level two, uh, which is typically considered a standard charger at a, at a home, if you have a, that can plug into a 240 volt outlet. And level three is a DC fast charger. Um, as far as readiness, there are a few different levels. EV capable means there's enough power to the site and there's conduit run, but not a wire or an outlet. EV ready means there is an outlet there, but not a charging station. And an EV charging station means you're ready to go. There's a charging station installed. And then as far as the number, it's the percent of parking spaces or for housing, sometimes the percent of dwelling units that have access to charging um, is typically how, how EV charging is codified in new construction. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> big change here. Um, there was a big change in Cal Green going from 2019 to 2022 for multifamily new construction, which has been a big target uh, of the EV reach codes. Uh, in 2019, Cal Green required 10% of spaces to be level two EV capable. 2022 is a big change. 10% need to be level two EV capable. That's that green color. 25% need to be level two EV ready with a low power circuit. Uh, and then 5% need level two EV charging installed. The requirement of level two EV charging installed means that since reach cuts have to go above and beyond the state code, meant that an update to our code was required. Uh, Peninsula Clean Energy is looking at the, the yellow and blue chart right there. 85% uh, level two EV ready low power. So that's a level two outlet. Um, and then 15% charging stations installed. That's a level two charging station installed. And that's one to one for the dwelling unit. So that's not a percentage of space. Cal Green is a percentage of parking spaces. But uh, our code, the goal is to make sure that each dwelling unit has access to charging. Um, so it's not necessarily about how many spaces, but how many uh, dwelling units. And then on the right, we have uh, SVC's preferred code. That's 60% level one EV ready. That's a typical 120 volt outlet and 40% level two EV charging stations installed. Next slide. Existing building reach codes, as I discussed earlier, existing buildings are uh, something that uh, we're really looking into this year. Electrifying existing buildings provides the greatest opportunities for local decarbonization within the building code. Uh, some reasons for that. While new construction is very important, 99% of our buildings year over year are existing. It takes 15 years to cost effectively electrify our building stock. That's because gas fired equipment lasts 15 years on average. Some existing building measures are zero cost to require, and some would need incentives to close the capital cost gap. Um, there are also broad policy actions that, we, that can help with long-term planning that don't necessarily have an immediate impact on uh, local buildings. Next slide. Uh, some example concepts are shown here. On the left, I have uh, some names and then on the right, kind of a summary of types of policies. Uh, no cost measures, those are specific requirements at the time of appliance replacement that would have no cost impact on the proposed project of a home or building owner. Uh, one is two way air conditioning. That's requiring that whenever an air conditioner is installed, it's also a heat pump. Um, that's no cost. Uh, when the tech incentive exists, 
which is on pause right now, uh, or if we add an incentive. And that means that, a, that a, a thing called a reversing valve, which I'm holding in my hand right here, has to be added to the outdoor unit, um, makes an air conditioner be able to be a heat pump. Uh, if there's already a circuit for a dryer, it's the same cost to install an electric dryer as a gas. Same with a range. Um, so those are no cost measure options. Uh, no cost policies. An end of flow ordinance uh, as Half Moon Bay has instituted, which says that by 2045, gas will be turned off. That's a long-term planning measure that can help with uh, utility planning at the CPUC. And then a time of sale disclosure that would require, Piedmont has enacted this. This would require that uh, at the time of the sale of a home or building, a form is filled out that lists the gas fired equipment that needs to eventually be decarbonized in the facility. Um, so another paper in the, in the stack of papers associated with the sale. Low cost and highly variable cost measures. Uh, renovations come in all shapes and sizes. Um, so different costs associated with electrification requirements. Electric make ready has a cost associated with it. Uh, so that's a, running an electric circuit. Heat pump water heaters, uh, variable that has a cost often of the make ready circuit above and beyond what a typical gas for gas replacement would be. And then dryers and ranges, if there's not already a circuit there, uh, running the circuit costs money. It depends on the length of the run, how much that would cost. And then the higher cost measure is if you do not have air conditioning, you have a furnace and you wanna make it a heat pump, there's a significant cost to add there. Um, as far as installation costs go. And I'm gonna walk through some of these. Next slide. I just talked through those different options. Uh, next slide. So here's uh, the variable cost measures we were talking about. I, I went through this. A lot of dryers already have an outlet behind them, but you have a gas dryer, but you have a 240 volt electric outlet. Uh, this, I, I looked this up specifically for delivery and installation to a home in San Mateo County, a gas dryer for the same exact dryer, which I've shown a picture of. It's about $100 more than an electric dryer. Um, if you have to run that circuit, though, that could add about $1,000 on average to the project. So there's a variability there. Next slide. This is the two-way air conditioner measure. Um, adding the reversing valve is approximately a thousand, depending on the contractor pricing, more than just having an air conditioner. Uh, so it would be, so, so six, maybe a $16,000 air conditioner would become a $17,000 air conditioner plus heat pump system. Next slide. Uh, the tech incentive that existed uh, was 3000 and that's on hold right now, looking for more funding. That's a statewide program. Uh, in that case, anyone who installed this under that program actually saved money versus installing a, just an air conditioner that wasn't capable of heat pump. So that's how incentives can help backstop policy. Um, next slide. And then on the operating cost side, um, here's some examples from a study. Uh, we're gonna be updating these, these this year as costs have changed on both sides of the equation. Uh, water heating, typically seeing marginal savings. Space, this is monthly energy costs. Space heating, heating to up to $10 savings per month. Uh, clothes drying, there's an increase in costs. Cooking, there is a monthly increase. Uh, the gas meter fee is savings. You no longer have to pay a gas bill if you fully electrify your building. And then on average, if an all electric home versus um, a home that uses gas for these appliances, we would see about a dollar a month in monthly energy cost savings depends on the home and the weather. So that's pretty variable. Um, these are some areas that the board may want to offer feedback uh, for new construction REITs codes, uh, when your city might bring them to, to council, um, whether a study session and two meetings may be required and how controversial new construction REITs codes will be this cycle. And I think that'll depend on the, the jurisdiction. And then on existing buildings, which is the next slide. Oh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious, uh, it, you, you might want to offer feedback on whether your uh, jurisdiction is anticipating bringing existing reach codes to council. Um, if so, when, 
uh, how many public meetings might be associated and how controversial that might be and, and whether it makes sense to, to pass at the same time as new construction is something that uh, I know staff has been curious about. Um, and that's some things we're thinking about. And I think we're on to Q&A. Okay. Um, Thank you. So Blake, are, are you asking uh, the questions that you presented in the last two slides, are you asking board members to comment on those questions tonight? I don't, I don't know. If you're... Um, those are some things that we have been considering and they might be worth commenting on. There might be other things board members can comment on as well. Okay, great. Are you listening? So... Yeah, so let, let, let me start with the, to see whether there are any questions. Can you hear me? From, yeah, we can hear you. Let, let me start to see if there's any questions from members of the board. Uh, Anne has her hand up. Anne, is yours a question or a comment? It's it's a collection. A collection? It's a collection. It's a comment, and then some um, real world. What's happening here? It could go to some of the questions, but also yeah. Let's do the questions. Time. Let's do the questions first. Well, let me do my critique first. Well, no, um, you you can do your critique after we take public comment. I'll, I'll first take questions. Mm, Carlos, do you have a question? Chair, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, chair, somebody is. Uh, let's see. I don't see anyone's face. Okay, I, I can I, I can go. It's a it's a quick question about level two high power, level two low power. Is that a reference to the amperage that is pulled by the outlet? Because level twos generally, or as far as I know, they're always two twenties or two forties, I'm sorry, right? In terms of, of volts. So could you explain the difference between a high power model? and then a low power, what this, what's this difference? Okay. Yeah, this is this is Philip also from the programs team. I'll, I'll jump in and uh, answer that on the EV side of things. Um, uh, so you're correct, but both level two um, uh, and low power level two both use a 220 or 240 volt circuit, it's actually 208 to 240, depending on commercial residential. The difference is in amperage, as you mentioned. So a uh, traditional level two or level two EV ready circuit is, a, is on a 40 amp circuit. And uh, the low power level two EV ready is on a 20 amp circuit. And this is an entirely new thing for the code. This has never been in Calgary before. It's, the, it's, a, it's a whole new concept introduced for the first time. Um, so it's a, it's a 20 amp circuit on a 208 to 240 volt line, and it's meant to be in between level one and level two. And so if you're to plug into it, um, if you're using a regular level two cord set, it's a different plug, it's a different outlet type, you would need an adapter or something like that to, to make that work. Thank you. And it, it is a uh, higher gauge wire. So thank you. Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Is, is there any other questions? Okay, I don't see any other questions. Uh, let's uh, see if Mr. there's- Mr. Chair, one question. Go ahead, Rick. So then does the lower amperage uh, charging, the difference is that it takes longer to charge? That's correct. So the low power level two would be at about 3.3 kilowatts of power compared to 6.6 .6 kilowatts of power for the full power level two. Um, so with uh, typical daily usage somewhere in the 10 to 15 kilowatt hour range um, for most commutes, 3.3 kW, we're talking about four or five hours of charging overnight. And Philip, it's worth mentioning that this is primarily affecting residential multi-unit dwellings. So there, it, this is overnight parking. So that's, in most cases, plenty of power for folks overnight. That's and, and just to clarify, that would be that you said four or five hours to fully charge the car. Oh, I was I was speaking to a typical um, daily usage. Oh, um, okay. 
which is somewhere depending on usage, of course, but averages are somewhere between 10 and 15 kilowatt hours per day are typical daily usages. Thank you. And to piggyback on, on Raphael's comment, uh, the low power level two um, unit, the requirement is, is just for multifamily charging in Calgary. Uh, and our comments. Okay, great. Um, okay, let me see if there's any public comment. Okay, I've got some public comment. Go ahead, Drew. Good evening, uh, board and staff. Um, so question slash comment on this. I think it's it seems like it's evolved a little bit um, as I've watched presentations in a good way for this level two low power. Um, I just wonder if that conduit, I know it's very technical, is big enough to possibly the conduit size and or the wires inside could be later uh, changed to high power and stuff. So you don't have to, you absolutely do not have to rerun conduit, but then hopefully don't have to rerun the wires and stuff. So, you know, five, 10 years from now, something changes, you can do the transformer side, you can do the outlet side, but you don't have to redo all the infrastructure in between. So I'm just wondering kind of where that is on that scale. Um, though this seems an improvement versus just having 110 outlets everywhere. If you're going to run power in the conduit, let's at least get to as much as possible so it's it's upsized appropriately for the next 50 years thank you okay great um let's see the next public comment is from zachary meyer all right can you hear me can you hear me Yes, go ahead. All right. Uh, hello and good evening. My name is Zachary Meyer. I'm a college student, a summer intern at Menlo Spark. And to steal a phrase from Sarah Ray, I'm also a member of the climate generation, generation of young people who have grown up knowing nothing but a world with the existential threat of climate change. I've grown up passionate with a desire to make an impact. However, I know I cannot do much on my own to save my generation, but a collective effort combined with smart, progressive policy, policy change will. That's why I'm here today to ask Chair DeGolia, directors and staff to please support the release of the full model reach code for existing buildings. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Zachary. The next comment is from Saman De Silva. Hey, good evening, board. My name is Saman De Silva. I'm a high school student from Palo Alto, and I would like to urge you all to support the release of the full model reach code for existing building after this evening's meeting. Uh, the clock is ticking for electrification in Bay Area cities. In San Mateo, among other cities, sustainability is a time-sensitive issue. The window for political leverage behind future forward climate policy is rapidly closing. So getting these codes ASAP must be a top priority to ensure we can follow scientific recommendations for aggressive policy goals especially considering that the timeline was once promised, uh, advocates and legislators alike are waiting for an action from PCE. Uh, this will also offer an opportunity to shine a light for cities like Palo Alto, uh, how they can consider reach codes and integrating this vital step. So please understand that the future of climate policy in the peninsula is contingent on getting these codes out ASAP. This release will dictate whether citywide electrification can hit scientific goals or lag behind because of political compl complications. Lead by example, please. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Claire Shintani. Hello, my name is Claire Shintani. I am 17 years old and have lived in San Mateo for the entirety of my life. I am a member of the San Mateo Climate Action Team. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you all tonight. My aunt lives on the beach. She worries that her home will be underwater as sea levels rise. My father is allergic to dead grass. His coughing fits and hives increase in severity as California grows drier. My friend's family home was destroyed in the Napa wildfires. She fears it will happen again. Like you, my friends and family are my first priority. It's horrible to see the very real effects of climate change on our loved ones. For these reasons, I ask that the model, research, model reach codes for existing buildings be released to the public. With this valuable resource, 
cities can collaborate with local businesses and residents in order to plan for the replacement of gas-fired appliances. Decarbonization can't wait. We need to ensure that San Mateo has the necessary policy tools to move forward with its important objective that the San Mateo City Council approved this year to decarbonize existing buildings and infrastructure and eliminate methane gas use by 2030. The release of the model breach codes for standing buildings is an imperative step for San Mateo and other cities like ours to move forward with such decarbonization objectives. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. The next comment is from Russell Chu. Uh, good evening, Chair DeGolia and directors. My name is Russell Chu, and I'm a rising senior at Christmas Spring Southland School. I'm speaking on behalf of Menlo Spark, as well as the growing group of climate-minded youth, whether it be the ne seemingly never-ending wildfires or volatile change in day-to-day -day temperature. We are all feeling the effects of climate ch uh, change in the Bay Area, big and small. Without aggressive intervention to prevent climate change from worsening, my generations and those that will follow will be the ones most heavily impacted. The Bay Area has the opportunity to serve as a catalyst for more aggressive climate action across the US. Uh, with building methane emissions being 30% of San Mateo County's greenhouse gas emissions in 2021, phasing out fossil fuels in homes through electric electrification is essential in reaching net zero emissions. Therefore, having a model reach code for existing buildings to decarbonize is, a necessary, is necessary to stay on track uh, to meet the 2030 complete decarbonization goal. As a student myself, I know it is always better to stay ahead of the curve rather than fall behind. Much like any long-term project, in order to meet our deadline, we must stay aggressive and complete at least an eighth of our job yearly. So please release the model uh, codes for existing building electrification right away so that cities have the resources they need to proceed. I'll closely monitor the progress of our work towards electrification. For it's the future of young people like me that we are working towards. Thank you for your time. Great, okay, thank you. And the next comment is from Robert White here. Honorable members of the board, staff, thank you so much for the opportunity tonight to address the board. I thank you and staff for the hard work that's gone into developing both a model reach code for new construction and a model reach code for existing buildings. We thank you for closing the reach code for new construction. San Mateo Climate Action Team respectfully requests that the entire model reach code for existing buildings be publicly released after today's board meeting. That way, individual cities working their, with their residents and businesses can decide how to plan for replacement of gas fired equipment to have an immediate direct impact in global warming. Cities and the residents that want to adopt full on reach codes for existing buildings should have that options. I believe that a strong reach code applicable to existing buildings is the only way here in San Mateo, we and our residents and businesses will be able to meet the city's 2030 goal to, de to decarbonize all existing buildings. Each of us in San Mateo individually can have a personal, directly positive impact on the climate crisis. Again, if we are willing to put that much in time and effort, we should be given every opportunity for success. We recognize the difficulty of electrifying existing buildings. But there are many people in your city, in your service areas that are already doing it and who are willing to work to help others electrify, as I am. With a reach code that clearly covers existing buildings, an informed purchase decision can be made. Residents and businesses won't have to worry about installing gas equipment that will quickly become obsolete. In closing, I understand that the board may decide not to release the full model reach code for existing buildings. But I respectfully ask this question, by releasing the model code for existing buildings, what better action is there to make us able to take together steps to help make an immediate beneficial impact on the climate crisis? Thank you. Next comment is from Libby Troutman. Good evening and thank you very much for all your hard work and uh, taking time to make these tough decisions for our communities. And I realize that I'm sitting here with a lot of feelings listening from the, listening to the students. I'm 81 and I have no idea where I'll be when they are young adults trying to start their own families. 
So I'd just really like to speak on their behalf and say, thinking about their future, we have a lot of tough decisions to make right now. And the climate crisis is facing us every day and challenging us to have new understandings and new actions to respond to this huge challenge that we are really learning about from day to day. And again, I'm following on what others have said, and I'd like to suggest that one thing that we can do right here is uh, replace our dependency uh, by adopting the REACH code uh, for existing buildings. We need to give up our dependency on gas and fossil fuels. And so I know this is a challenge. Uh, it's going to be costly time, but if we don't do it, who knows what the future will hold for these young students who are here. So on their behalf, please, let's take this very, very seriously. And thank you so much for your time and attention to all these problems. Thank you, Libby. Uh, the next comment is from Vivian Scott. Hi, my name is Vivian Scott. I'm 17 years old and I'm a San Mateo resident as well as a member of the San Mateo Climate Action Team. The climate crisis has always been impactful to me. And since I was young, I've recognized the weight of it upon our communities. I grew up with asthma and throughout the past few years have had periods where I didn't leave my house due to smoke. I've had worse asthma symptoms within the last three years than I've ever had in my life due to wildfire smoke after simply stepping outside and in some cases not going outside at all. Recently, I've been able to see the effects of climate change in our own backyards, seeing worsening droughts and an increase in wildfires, including the current Edgewood fire right next door, and have been doing my part in fighting it because climate change is not the future, it is happening right now. Because of this, I want to see the city of San Mateo achieve the objective adopted by our city council this year to establish policies to decarbonize existing buildings and infrastructure and eliminate methane gas use by 2030. And I request that the entire model reach code for existing buildings be released to the public after the PCE board meeting so that San Mateo can achieve that extremely important objective. The only way that the community of San Mateo will be able to meet the goal to decarbonize all existing buildings by 2030 is through a publicly available model reach code. The complete model reach code for existing buildings that has not been released to the public apparently provides many different options for a placement of gas powered appliances and is vital in fulfilling our goals of decarbonization, as well as turning these concepts into real action. Releasing the model reach code is the best way for San Mateo to move forward and take the next step in decarbonizing buildings. And I ask you for your support on this. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Uh, the next comment is from Suzanne Emerson. Uh, hello, my name is Suzanne Emerson from San Carlos. I'm a green building special inspector and I, an advocate for decarbonization. Um, the staff report mentioned that TRC is performing a study on the cost of existing building electrification, but it did not mention when that will be uh, completed and released. I'm interested in knowing the answer to that question. I feel like the clock is really ticking for municipalities to evaluate publicly discuss and then adopt reach codes for the start of the next code cycle, and that we need the draft existing building reach code as soon as possible in order to kick off those public discussions. Thank you for your leadership on reach codes. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Is there any other public comment? Okay, I don't see any, so I'll bring it back to the board um, for any comments from members of the board. Anne. Thank you, Chair. Um, going first with um, City of Millbrae, um, for the updated new building codes, we had a carve out for biotech. And it turns out that all of our biotechs that have recently applied and are going through the process are going all electric. So staff, you may want to use Millbrae as an example of why biotech can go all electric. In terms of our restaurants, the restaurant tours are often in rental property in older buildings, and most of them have told me they would like to go all electric with one proviso, the occasional type of food that needs gas. But our properties are owned sometimes by third generation family 
or foreign investors, and nobody wants to invest into that. So if you can do some, well, I'm jumping into existing buildings. If you can look at that problem within existing buildings, that can help us with our restaurants. In terms of new construction bouncing backwards, we had a very large apartment complex that used Senate Bill 35 and Senate Bill 330 to get out of all electric apartment buildings. And I'm gonna guess, I should know this, but the new laws, they don't come to council anymore um, to get out of the kitchen in the common areas. But you might wanna look at the housing laws and how they can be used to prevent cities from requiring climate resiliency work, including reach codes. Now, in terms of existing buildings, I am trying to replace a water heater in my house. I had to put in air conditioning. This is in Mountain View, my house in Mountain View, not my Milbury house. And um, the panel has to be upgraded. That's thousands of dollars. And to get up to 220, it could cost me $40,000 to bring the wiring up the, the court that I live on. So when you're looking at existing building electrification, the cost of bringing the wiring in is outrageous. And I was told it could be a six month to 12 month wait for PG&E to do that work. I have a leaking water heater right now. So sadly, I'm gonna have to stay with gas. But those are the problems I've had trying to go all electric in existing building. And my last comment on your very first slide of California, I am a geographer. I'm a firm believer in maps. I would love to see you come back with that map with every city in San Mateo County that has reach codes. I do believe Milbury has had them for several years and we're not on your map. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ann. Harvey. Uh, I'd like to explain what happened in Half Moon Bay. We had initially a really good existing building reach code that would have required uh, replacement of uh, burnt out uh, gas appliances. All uh, even small remodels would have to uh, be all electric. It, uh, it would have very few exceptions. It was a, what I thought was a really wonderful ordinance. It had incredible pushback. You have no idea how much the community uh, rose up mostly arguing about expenses. Um, so we, we first uh, eliminated the burnout provisions. Then we had to eliminate the uh, remodel and uh, uh, small and big remodel provisions. Then uh, we gave an exception to the largest uh, use of natural gas in the city, namely uh, uh, commercial greenhouses. So this is just a warning to any city that is really considering the existing building issue. You have to educate the public. You have to explain why it's really in the interest of the entire community. It's a health and safety issue. Uh, and it is expensive. Uh, you just heard what uh, Ann had to say about how expensive it is. And uh, there's rebates and uh, the state is probably going to uh, help out more, but um, if we really want to make a dent in in methane emission, it's the existing buildings, and it's extremely difficult. If our experience in Half Moon Bay is any indication, so I think you need to start educating the public as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, Rick Benia. Uh, thank you, uh, Rick. Um, in San Mateo, uh, in January, when we were doing our um, new priorities for the coming fiscal year, I put into the work plan and the council members accepted uh, unanimously uh, to eliminate methane use in the city of San Mateo by 2030. Uh, to do that, we do need existing building reach codes, and we need to get them as soon as possible so we can start working on that. Um, the people in San Mateo have shown and huge outpouring of support. We get people talking under public comment when this is not on the agenda, six, eight, 10 people urging the city council to move forward with this as soon as possible and to find ways to help people be able to pay for the changes that are needed. So the city of San Mateo is working. We're looking for uh, ways to do what we need to do. 
Uh, the council is fully supportive. The people are supportive. We do understand there may be some help coming from the state, but what we do need right now, most critically, is to see those um, model reach codes for existing buildings uh, as soon as possible. So I just want to add to many public comments we heard earlier, asking for the release of that uh, after this meeting. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Rick. Betsy. Thank you. And I just want to echo everything that's been said, both from the students and from other um, fellow the colleagues. Um, just I think it's super important to release the new reach codes for existing buildings as quickly as possible. We are much stronger if we work together. And if this is a region wide approach rather than just individual cities trying to develop their own reach codes, I think it's really important to um, do this, especially um, from Peninsula Clean Energy. Um, and then just, um, I guess, two other comments. One is that we have a group um, that includes residents and um, from many parts of the region who are looking at, um, but especially a, a couple of residents in Menlo Park who are looking at watt diets and ways that people can actually electrify without doing panel upgrades. And so that's something that perhaps um, we can, I know that um, uh, Philip Reyes and others are know about this, perhaps it's something that we can discuss um, bringing to PCE or maybe it's through CAC at some point, um, just to get more information out there about that. Um, but it's ways that people might not have to do the huge panel upgrades um, with electrification. And then also um, just Menlo Park um, this last week um, fun, partnered with Block Power to bring citywide electrification to Menlo Park. Um, this is a voluntary program, and we were partnering with Job Train to um, and Block Power to uh, build a workforce training program. And hopefully, that will really um, help all cities um, with getting more contractors um, knowledgeable in a few months about um, electrification. And we're really excited about it. And please, we need to bring the um, the reach codes forward as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Betsy. Ann Schneider, you have another comment? Thank you, yes. I just wanna echo what Director Nash said. Actually, the Mountain View building inspector and then one of my neighbors down there did a load analysis and was able to prove that their load was much lower and they could get away with a 125 panel upgrade instead of a 220, depending on what else is in the house. But when I opened this stuff up, I said, oh my gosh, I've got two science degrees. I can't do this. If we had a job training program that could help people, this is more than just a simple home energy audit. That would be wonderful. That, that's great. Thanks, Betsy, for that. You reminded me. It's still scary as heck, though. Okay. Uh, thank you. And Carlos. Uh, yes. Um, I, so I'm in, in concept, I'm in support of moving to existing residential electrification. However, in practice, particularly for lower income folks, seniors on fixed income, um, who you know may indeed be replacing their water heater, <clears throat> may indeed be uh, having to replace a air conditioner with a heat pump air conditioner. Um, we're we're going to have a, a a time tough time of it initially, figuring out I think how those lower income fixed income folks can actually afford this and. You know, perhaps we have subsidy programs, perhaps the state does this. Um, I think just, just from an equity perspective, it can indeed be, be costly to folks um, who are just, you know, not making perhaps the median income um, of, uh, of San Mateo County, which is now very, very high for family four. I believe it's $169,000. Um, and, and our median income for a family of four in East Palo Alto is $63,000. So I'm, I'm in support of this. I think we have to think about how we subsidize potentially these conversions. I think this is kind of the biggest nut to crack and we get a lot of bang for it. But um, clearly as we move forward and certainly when we discuss this in East Palo Alto and I plan to 
talk to the mayor to agendize it, this equity issue will indeed be front and center as to how we fund it and how we make sure that they're not disparate impacts on lower income, working class and people of color. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Carlos. Uh, Sam. Thank you, Chair. And let me start by echoing what just Carlos said. Uh, that is very important. But also, in addition to that, like a community like Foster City, most of our power line are underground. I recently looked at myself at upgrading and putting a heat pump. Uh, I put solar uh, some at some time ago, and I had to upgrade my panel. That was achievable. But to go from 120 to 200 panel, we would need to pull lines from the street and PGE need to come in and do that. And I was given cost somewhere around $100,000. So that is something to definitely would be prohibitive to people to electrify all their existing homes at such a prohibiting cost. Uh, I'm not sure if other communities have mostly underground, but for sure, Foster City does have most of our electrical line minus the main power transmitting line underground. So that's uh, a problem. Great, okay, thanks, Sam. Betsy, do you have another comment? I just wanna um, acknowledge, yes, it is so important that we do get um, financing to help our lower income residents. Um, they are the ones who are often, um, certainly in Menlo Park, they are at the front of climate action, climate change and um, first of all, just with uh, things as simple as they have uh, less canopy, so they're much more affected by a tree canopy, so they're much more affected by the heat. And um, one of the benefits of electrifying is um, that the heat pumps come with the air conditioning, which everyone knows, but it actually gives people an opportunity as you electrify, not only to um, provide health benefits to people who are often in smaller homes where the um, effects of the gas cooking, effects of gas is much more intense because it's uh, much more concentrated. Also, it provides the um, air conditioning to people who haven't had it before. And so um, with our block power um, work, we are actually focused on the Bellhaven community and on um, making sure that they can get um, do electrification either um, free or at very low cost. And um, just hopefully as we do this, it will spread, we will get ideas and um, be able to um, help other communities. But it's, it's super important and it's a real issue because um, people don't have the finances, but they're also oftentimes most affected by the impacts of the using gas appliances. Uh, Blake, did you want to give a comment? Yeah, I, I heard the panel upgrade discussed a few times and just wanted to make a note that uh, we're working diligently on some design guidelines to work through that. Uh, we've spoken with Electrify My Home, who's done over 100 uh, full home electrifications, and they've said they can do it in 100 amps almost every time, but it requires full household planning. Uh, Tom Kabat, uh, the Menlo Park resident, has uh, led a lot of the effort here, and um, we're working with who I consider to be the best, one of the best electrical engineers in the state, David Kaneda, on some design guidelines to test that. Uh, we hear that loud and clear, especially for underground cables, and are doing deep analysis on that and hope to release that soon. Okay, thanks, Blake. Uh, are there any other comments? Okay, I don't see any other comments. Ann Schneider? Hi, Chair. I don't get to come that often anymore. Yeah, um, the other yeah. issue, my city manager is very conf concerned about electrification and public safety power shutoffs. So with one of our new projects, um, when I had my one-on-one -on -one with Trammell Crow and we talked about reflective roofing, 
to reduce energy consumption within the building, they're already there. I just love our new companies coming into Millbrae, but it would be, but my city manager said, well, we're waiting for the universal building codes. I brought this up as a public member a couple of months ago, but um, Mr. Hershaft, if you're looking at other things to go into the code changes, things that can also make our home, our existing buildings and new more efficient will help us make sure we've got the power during the times when we don't have a lot of renewables. And that, that's my city manager's biggest concern on this. And having come from the recycled world, sometimes we oversold in the early years how good quality recycled paper was, and it hurt recycled paper for decades. So making sure we've got a steady supply through those heat waves is really important. Thank you. Okay, uh, I don't see any other comments on this item. And this is the last item other than board member reports. Uh, so if anyone has a board member report, now would be a good time. Betsy. I actually just wanted to ask, what is the downside of releasing the reach codes for existing buildings today? Uh, <clears throat> Well, they're in a they're in a little bit of a draft form, um, and as we also wanted to bring them to the board uh, before we wanted to bring this topic up in front of the board before releasing them was the main thing, so that the board had a chance to re to discuss this item and give feedback. Okay. So I have a question, Mr. Chair. Well, so we're not off this issue then. Go ahead, Rick. All right, Donna, did you have a comment on, on the last item? On no, no, my, my, my comment is just a board member report item. Okay, uh, Rick, is yours on the reach codes? Yes, it is. Go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanna ask, um, so, so we have the uh, existing building reach codes in draft form at this time. Would you want to bring them to the board? Uh, when do we think they'll be prepared for use by the cities? I would say they're at a form of development now when uh, coordinating with cities is appropriate. Uh, we're not having a lot of cities, except yours, uh, prepared to move on that. And I, um, I, I'm i very confident that our process is not slowing down um, the process in San Mateo, which we're very appreciative of the leadership there. Okay, um, but I'm just trying to figure out when though. Uh, I would say they're they're about ready. They're, I, I would say they're, I just worked on finalizing them yesterday um, with Farhad on the, on the TRC team um, and re-reviewed them in preparation for this meeting to, to feel confident that they're ready for circulation. Okay, thank you. So then who's gonna make the decision about when we're able to release them? Uh, I Blake, think, I, I'll, st I'll, I'll step in here. Um, so I think we just need a, a, a final uh, review uh, by uh, uh, Jan uh, to make sure that it has uh, everything that she's expecting to see. And then at that point, we would be ready to re release it. And, and uh, Jan, we can get these to you uh, immediately and uh, hopefully uh, then perhaps next week um, might be an appropriate time. Okay, that's good news. Thank you very much, Rafael. And, and Blake has have the state codes that are scheduled to be changed been published? Yes, uh, the existing building measures have less less to do with leaning on those state codes as new construction. Um, existing building sort of stands on its own. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so. Uh, let me just see, are there any other comments on the REACH code matter? Okay, then we'll go to member reports. Uh, Donna. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Rick. I just wanted to thank uh, Jan Pepper for attending the ribbon cutting for the new net zero energy building um, and graciously uh, sharing with my colleagues the wonderful award you guys gave us for the um, Green Building Award for the commercial building in San Mateo County. Um, the building, the, the ribbon was cut, uh, Supervisor Pine joined us um, and uh, council, a couple other council people, council member um, Pappen, along with ours, our council members. And 
it was such a joy to see the people, the little children, the seniors running into the building and everyone was just delighted and so excited and thankful that the building was net zero energy. And the kitchen is uh, all electric. Everything we did in there was all electric. So I, I hope all of you will have a chance sometime to drop by. It's behind me in my screen. I think you can see it somewhere back there. And I, and I, and I hope you'll all come by and see it because it, it, I really appreciate all of your support and um, assistance in helping us with the reach codes and everything that we needed in order to deliver this beautiful asset to the community. Thanks, Donna. Uh, John. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Siobhan and Andy uh, for their years of service and wish them well in the future. And I'm sure all the board agrees with me. That is certainly true. Uh, they've given remarkable service to us and uh, we will dearly miss them. We've told Andy that for quite a while, but Siobhan's departure is new information and a real loss, real serious loss. Uh, Tom. Thanks, uh, echo those sentiments and want to thank Mark Hirschman for coming out. I'm retiring from teaching has taken a little bit of time. Uh, and I had my big retirement concert a couple of weeks ago. Mark came out, was there. It was very nice to see that friendly face in the audience as well. We had a bunch of alumni come back. So uh, thanks for having, for having someone there from PCE. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Tom. Are there any other board member reports? Well, I can report that over the last two weeks, Atherton opened its entire new town center, which is uh, most recently included the library and everyone should come visit it. There's no natural gas connected to any building in the entire uh, town center and, uh, and, and all the buildings, both inside and outside, there's no natural gas. So 100% electric and um, seems to be operating great. Okay, uh, motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. So moved. Thank you. Uh, have a good month, everybody. We will see you in July. Thank you. Care. Okay.